Hello all. I hope you all are safe and healthy. I am Ravi and I am working at Samsung Semiconductor India R&D. Today I will present a session on automotive Ethernet, which is emerging in today's automotive world and connected vehicles. Let me go through the overall agenda of this session. First, we will go through the overview of automotive systems and its network evolution. Then we will see what are the different technologies which is used in today's automotive networks. We will see the different network protocol like Lean, CAN, Flexray, Most, and so on. Then we will discuss about the future requirements in the networking domain of automotive industry as complexity is increasing continuously over the time. Then we will see the motivation which leads us toward the need of automotive Ethernet in spite of there are so many protocols which are existing over the last decades. Later, we will discuss why conventional Ethernet cannot be directly used in the automotive industry. In the next slide, we will see the history and the evolution of automotive Ethernet from where it is started and what are the different technologies it evolved over the time. Then we will see the protocol format of the automotive Ethernet. In that, we will see the data link layer and IP layer protocols. Then we will discuss the different technologies which is used in the automotive Ethernet, like AutoSAR, Open, Power Over Ethernet, Energy Efficient Ethernet, and so on. Later on, we will go through the support of automotive Ethernet inside the layers. In that, we will see how the time sensitive networking is supported in the layers. Then we will see the difference at the physical layer. In that, we will see the physical layer overview of automotive Ethernet. At last, as a conclusion, we will discuss the overall benefits of the automotive Ethernet and what are the different challenges which automotive industry is currently facing. Let's start with the overview first. The automotive industry has very long history, which was initially started with the steam engines, then later internal combustion engines came, then nowadays we are seeing a hybrid and electric versions. The normal car contains too many moving parts, so it contains too many actuators and sensors. To connect and control them, controller is also present. During initial days, all these components are connected by normal wires. Now think about the requirements of wires and its complexity. If we use the normal wires to connect them, that's how the various vendors and groups has developed the different protocols to fulfill those requirements of automotive data communication. Now, if you have seen the car bonnet, then you must have seen the wires connected at the different parts. This wiring is called nothing but the wire harness, and it is the third highest cost component of the car because of its complexity. In fact, companies try to skip the wire harness under the standard vehicle warranty in order to reduce the company burden. We saw how complex is automotive network. Now, let's look into the recent trend in automotive network. As we know, the automotive vehicle and ECU or engine control unit is present, which is basically controls the vehicle function related to engines, infotainment system, and newly trending ADAS system. As you can see in the image that the different protocols are used in typical automotive vehicle depending on the usage and the bandwidth requirement. Now let's look over the different protocol one by one quickly. The first one is a link, which is local interconnect network, which is announced in late 1990. It basically provides a very low cost network in a vehicle. It is a single master bus and provides the speed up to 20 kbps. Since it is a single master, it is mostly used to connect the sensors and the controller. Then next comes CAN, which is a controller area network. And it is known as, it is known for the its robustness and safety. It basically developed by the Bosch in 1986 and it is a multi-master protocol and it provides a data rate up to 1 Mbps. Since it is a multi-master, it is used to connect different controllers and controller to sensor. Depending upon the requirement, there are some variations created over the time, like TTCAN, CAN-FD. 
the next guy is a flex ray which is an alternative of high speed can and it provides more reliability and more speed compared to the can but it is a more, also more expensive than the can it provides a speed up to 10 mbps and it is a multi master protocol it can have two independent data channels in order to provide the fault tolerance the next one is a most which is a media oriented system transport as the name suggests it is a high speed multimedia protocol which is used to transfer audio video voice and data transmission it is mostly used in the infotainment system it provides the bandwidth up to 25 mbps and it can go further up to 150 mbps at last comes ethernet which is a packet based protocol and it can support the speed up to 10 gbps there are multiple standards available at the different layers to support different functionalities we will focus on automotive ethernet in upcoming slides apart from this protocol there are other protocol exist in the market but it is not that much popular as we seen in the previous slide that there are multiple protocol exist for a different type of use case but the development and the need of advancement in automotive industry has not stopped yet nowadays everyone wants a car with the advanced feature like adas which includes adaptive cruise control around view monitor lane detection automatic braking and so on also we want all these features which are easily controllable from the single dashboard and without losing the reliability and the safety of the car so these future requirements create another problem like increasing the number of wires and its complexity it also creates a problem to integrate these new features into a single software and providing access to the dashboard without losing the losing and reliability and safety of the vehicle the requirement are basically never endless in the world then why we need automotive internet what is the motivation behind it well there are some of the things which basically invoke the concept of automotive ethernet as we know in automotive industry that sharing all the data requires a higher bandwidth now you can imagine a case of lane detection where single sensor requires a bandwidth up to 70 mbps now here the ethernet is a famous protocol which is providing a speed of in gbps automotive ethernet is a very safe and cost worthy network compared to the other protocol it provides significantly higher data rates so we can combine multiple can bus into a single ethernet connection so wiring and installation cost are greatly reduced automotive ethernet provides a different features like quality of service time sensitive networking so real time communication and transmission of low priority data at the same time is possible it has a advanced security features which can protect highly connected vehicle from hackers and viruses it can be easily integrated with the existing tcp ip protocol automotive ethernet has a very low silicon cost and it requires very less space for wires and the connectors then question comes into the mind that why we cannot use normal ethernet in the automotive industry so there are number of reasons behind that very first thing is that the normal ethernet requires at least four wires which is not accepted here because our target is to reduce the amount of wiring the second thing is that there is a high radio frequency interference and emi is present inside the car which normal ethernet cannot be able to tolerate as we know that a normal ethernet use csms cd mechanism to detect the carrier and transmit the data so it cannot provide a guaranteed latency in terms of microseconds there is a requirement of bandwidth control for different streams so the normal ethernet cannot be fulfilled the precise time synchronization is not exist at the protocol level of normal ethernet the temperature of the car can go up to 125 degrees centigrade and the acceleration of the car can up to go up to 4 4g so which conventional ethernet cannot able to handle the normal ethernet does not comply with the automotive safety or ac level certification so there is a need of low power standby mode during the engine of condition and instant backup is also required to unlock the vehicle quickly so this type of requirement the normal ethernet cannot able to fulfill 
Now let's see the history and the evolution of automotive Ethernet and how it is evolved for the different generation. Now automotive Ethernet is a subcategory of Ethernet, which, which is specified in the IEEE 802.3 specification. It basically operates over a single pair of twisted wires and it is specifically designed for the low radiated emissions and immunity requirement of the automotive industry. The operating distance is, operating distance is a much shorter than the normal Ethernet. As you can see in the picture, that automotive Ethernet has almost crossed three generations from the year 2010 to till now. In the 2010, it started with the use of Ethernet in cars for the diagnostic and firmware update. It is using 100 base TS standard, though it does not meet the automotive requirement. But since this interface is only used for the diagnostic and service purpose, an exception was added for its usage in the car. Then in 2015, the advanced driver assistance and infotainment systems came into the picture. In that time, Ethernet is used only for point-to-point -point links. It is not used as a shared medium for different interfaces. In that time frame, the different groups like border reach and audio video bridging has been released the different standard for the interface of automotive Ethernet. In later stage, it has been extended to support more bandwidth up to 1 Gbps and Vendors has now started using the Ethernet in a full phase mode. Here, the second generation of AVB standards has been started evolving. The new advancement not only helps to reduce the cost and weight, but it also makes it easier for the different system to cooperate in the car. Now, let's see the frame format. It is almost same as conventional Ethernet. The very first is the Ethernet frame. So as we can see, the first seven byte, which is known as preamble bits, that contains the pattern of alternating zeros and ones. It contains, it indicates at station side that the frame is going to be start and it also enables the sender and receiver to establish a bit synchronization. The next one byte is a SFD or a start out frame delimiter, with, which, which is always set to some fixed sequence of zeros and ones. The last two bits are always one, which is indicating that end of SFD field and marks the beginning of the current frame. The next comes destination address, which is a six byte field and contains MAC address of the destination for which the data is going to be sent. Then after comes the source address, which is also a six byte field and it contains the MAC address of the source, which, which is the sending the data. The next two bytes are reserved for the length, which specify the length of the data field. Here, the, this field is required because the Ethernet is using variable size frame. Then after data fields came into the picture, which, which size can go from 0 byte to 1500 byte, and it contains the actual payload of the frame. Now, as per the specification, the minimum payload size of the frame must be 46 bytes. So, Padding field is required according to the size of data. At the last, the frame check sequence or FCS is set, which is a four byte field and it contains the CRC code of error detection. Now, next is the IP layer, which is also the same as conventional Ethernet. At the IP layer, the IP packet is made up of two parts the IP header and the IP body. From a packet filtering point of view, the IP header contains very interesting piece of information. The IP packet contains various fields like source address, destination address, time to leave, type of protocol, offset of the packet, IP version, flag, and so on. If a packet is too large to cross the given the network, the IP packet is divided into smaller, smaller packets, which is called as a fragments. The fragmenting of the IP packet does not change its structure at the IP layer, but the body of the each IP packet contains only small piece of information. Now let's dig into the some different technologies of automotive Ethernet. First, we will go through AutoSAR, which is known as Automotive Open System Architecture. AutoSAR is formed in 2003 by major automotives. The main objective of AutoSAR is to create and establish an open and standardized software architecture, which can be used in automotive electronics. The AutoSAR basically provides the specification of basic software module 
which defines application interface and builds a common development methodology based on the standard data exchange format. Its software architecture can be used in vehicle of different manufacturers and electronic components of the different suppliers, so which in turn reduce the cost of research and the development. Based on this principle, AutoSAR is mainly focusing on upcoming technologies. Now, AutoSAR is a basically three-layer software. The first, first layer is a basic software, which is a standardized software module and the other service, which can be used as the functional part of the upper layer software. The second layer is a runtime environment or RTE. It is a middleware software, which is abstracted from the network topology of ECU information exchange layers which is present between the app, application software component and between the basic software and the application. The last layer is the application layer, which contains application software component, which is interacting with the runtime environment. Now, next technology is the open, which is a short form of open pair ethernet. It is a basically an alliance, which is a non-profit and open industry alliance. It contains automotive industry and technology providers. It encourages the wide scale adoption of Ethernet based network, which can be used as a standard in automotive networking applications. It basically enables the deployment and the existing IEEE 100 based T1, 1000 based T1, and 1000 based RH physical layer specification. Its goal is to complete the ecosystem further with the requirement and test specification for harness, switches, issues, and additional functionalities. It encourages and supports the development of new physical layer solution and in a standard setting organization. It continuously identifies and addresses the gaps related to the implementation of Ethernet-based communication in automotive domain. Now, next technology comes is the POE or Power over Ethernet. The POE is a basically a technique to provide the DC power over the existing Ethernet cable. So the requirement of separate power line and outlet is removed. It was basically standardized as the IEEE 802.3 AF in 2003 and specified that the power can be either provided by the spare wires or the data wires. The standard basically also includes a mechanism to protect device which does not support the POE mechanism. A standard 25 kilowatt resistor is added between the power pairs at the power device size and the power source provides the power only if something similar to 25k resistance is detected. Carrying both power and the data across a single cable not only reduces the cabling needs but it also improves the safety and the simplifies the installation which in turn helps the saving time and reducing the cost. At the later stage, the power supported by the POE is increased to support a wider variety of end device. So there are several additions and improvements made over the original specification. Now we will see about the Triple E, which is a short form of energy efficient Ethernet. Triple E is a basically set of enhancement over the standard Ethernet physical layer that reduce the power consumption during the period of low power, low data activity. The main intention of Triple E is to reduce the power consumption by almost 50% of more while retaining the full compatibility with the existing equipment. In a fast Ethernet like Gigabit Ethernet or 10 Gigabit links, the constant and significant energies used at the physical layer as the transmitters are always active whether the data is being sent or not. This range of power consumption can go around 1 watt, which is a significantly high. Now, as you can see in the image that when there is a no data to send, the software puts the physical link into the low power mode by issuing a low power idle request to the Ethernet controller. The file layer then sends the LPA symbols to the transmission link for a specific amount of time and then it disables the transmitter. Now to maintain the link active, a refresh signal is going to be sent at a specific amount of intervals. Again, when there is a data to transmit, the normal idle signal is going to be sent for specific amount of time. So that indicates at the receiver side that the data transmission is going to be start. 
here the data link is always considered as active because the circuit at the receiver side remains active even when the transmission data line is in sleep mode now what is a low power header the main concept of low power header is to transmit the data as fast as possible and immediately return back to the low power idle mode it basically saves the energy by switching between active and low power idle and the power can be reduced by turning unused circuit during the low power mode now let's see the time synchronization which is one of the part of time sensitive networking the tsn is a basically group of ic which is formed in the 2012 before tsn there is a audio video bridging group is present and later on it is renamed to the tsn for making it for wider scope in the tsn there is a very well known ipoli 802.1 as protocol which defines the synchronization of timing among the nodes connected in the network in this protocol there is a based master clock algorithm which decides the master clock and the master node a master node distributes the clock information to all ipoli supported nodes this protocol is able to support different network technologies such as ipoli 802.3 EPON and IEEE 802.11 wireless LAN. But the transfer and the synchronization message depends on the network media due to the difference time time mechanism. We will see in the detail about this in upcoming slides. Now, time synchronization is used as a time critical application like ADAS, which includes adaptive cruise control, emergency brake assist, and so on. There is another important protocol which is nothing but diagnostic over ip or simply DOIP, which is widely used to analyze the data from onboard computers and to update the firmware of ecus and tcus the protocol is based on iso 13400 standard which specifies the requirement of diagnostic communication between external test equipment and vehicle electronic components as an example while servicing your car you must have seen the technician with the OBD connector, which, which has a very small display, and they are basically attaching it to your to the your car to rectify your car issues. Those OBD connectors are nothing but the example of DOIP. Sometimes the technician also connects the laptop for the firmware updates. The DOIP allows faster data rate at lower cost compared to conventional scan based diagnostics. As we discussed that one of the advantage of automotive Ethernet is it can be easily integrated with the TCP IP protocol and it provides the open source software support. So let's see the support of automotive Ethernet in the Linux. I will discuss the time sensitive networking in upcoming slides as time awareness is the one of the key difference between conventional Ethernet and automotive Ethernet. Now let's see the time sensitive networking. The TSN is a basically set of standards which is developed by the IEEE 802.1 group. It is called as a IEEE Time Sensitive Networking Task Group. Before TSN, the ABB group was present, which has defined some standard to stream or transfer the audio and video over the Ethernet to meet the bandwidth and latency requirement. The TSN was formed in 2012 by adding some new standards and upgrading existing of the ABB group. As you can see in the image, the TSN focus on four different parameters. The first one is the time, which means that all devices connected to the network should have same time information. Then next comes synchronization, which means that all nodes in the network have sub microsecond or nanosecond level of accuracy all the times. It ensures precise controlling of the node. Now you can imagine a case in automatic network, like if an engine controller decides to apply brake on or four wheels, and if there is a small delay between any of the breaks, then how the serious scenario it can be. Now, next is a traffic shipping, which means that time critical messages on the network should be reached to the target destination, irrespective of interference from other traffic. As an example, when you apply the emergency break, then it should be get applied immediately. The last is a boundary latency, which means that the messages traveling in the network should reach the decision within a specific time and the latency should be guaranteed. As we have studied in our academic that 
there are basically seven layers of OSI system in the reference implementation. But in practical, only four or five layers are exist. Now the TSN sits on layer two, which is a data link layer. The TSN requires support of at hardware and software both for the proper functionality. Rest of the upper layer protocol like IP layer and TCP UDP layer mostly remain unchanged. Now being TSN at data link layer keeps the delay and the interference very less, which helps to achieve timing and latency requirement of the specification. Now, as we can see in the previous slide, that TSN is the set of standards and extension of existing ABB group. So here you can see the blue mark boxes, which is the part of ABB group, and the gray mark boxes, which indicates the extension of newly developed TSN standard. Now, the 802.1 ES is known as a precision, precision time protocol or simply PTP, and it is first standardized in 2002. The aim of PTP is to provide a mechanism of syncing the absolute time over the standard Ethernet. The basic PTP uh, protocol has gone through several divisions, but there are most, uh, almost two dominant versions. One is the IEEE 1588 series, which is commonly named as PTP, and the second one is the IEEE 802.1 AS series, which is known as a GPTP or generalized PTP. The IEEE 802.1 AS has reduced the number of supported options in order to improve the better performance. As you can see in the image, that IEEE 802.1 AS REV is the latest draft standard and it is the part of TSN. Its goal is to tighten up the performance requirement to the next level to accommodate the emerging TSN standard. <coughs> For research, resource management like streaming, the IEEE 802.1 QAT was standardized in 2010, which is known as a string reservation protocol or simply SRP. It defines the concept of string layer at layer two of OSI model. <clears throat> there is a listener and talker kind of concept in the streaming. Later on, as an enhancement of 802.1 QAT, and IEEE 802.1 QCC was formed in 2018. The, aim was, the basic aim was to provide better quality of service over the existing one. For the transfer stream and control, there are basically two protocols, IEEE 1722 and 1722.1. IEEE 1722 is the layer two audio video transport protocol, which was formed in 2011, and it defines the details of transmitting specific streams over the other AV formats. It sets the presentation time for each AV stream and manages the latency. On top of that, IEEE 1722.1 allows AVB discovery, enumeration, connection management, and control of the devices. It basically forms into 2013 from existing 1722 protocol. Both IEEE 1722 protocol bypasses the middle layer standards of networking stack. So there are no enhancements made in the TSN. For traffic scheduling, IEEE 802.1 QAB provides the forwarding and the buffering of time-sensitive packets. It was standardized in 2009 and provides a guarantee for time-sensitive and loss-sensitive real-time audio-video data transmission. The credit-based shaper or CBS, which is one of the earliest traffic shaper, which was standardized in the ABB. After that, the different traffic shaper was standardized in the TSN like IEEE 802.1 QCH, which introduced double buffering concept. Then it allows bridges to synchronize transmission in a cyclic manner. Then next came IEEE 802.1 QBV, which separates the communication on to the on communication on the network into the fixed length and repeating time cycle. We will see in upcoming slides in this detail. For asynchronous network traffic, IEEE 802.1 QCR is the form, and it uses local clock in each bridge to manage the traffic. The standards IEEE 802.1 QBU and IEEE 802.1 BR is used for preemptable traffic, in that preemptable frame is interrupted to pass the express frames. There are other protocols like 
802.1 CB, 802.1 QCA, and 802.1 QCA, which defines the method for fault tolerance, and it is a, one of the important aspect of the TSM. In next slide, we will see the popular protocol like PTP and traffic schedule in detail. As we have seen in the previous slide, that the time synchronization is a standardized IEEE 802.1 AS protocol. This protocol is implemented in the Linux as a Linux PTP. As we have seen in the previous slide, that PTP, uh, PTP protocol uses the best master clock algorithm to determine the master clock in the event network. And then after the master node, it is determined by the master clock, which distributes the clock information to all other nodes. This sharing of the clocking is done at the data link layer and the hardware. So the clock accuracy is achieved in terms of nanoseconds. There is another similar protocol, which is known as a network type protocol or NTP. And it runs basically on the network layer, but it provides less accuracy due to the addition of the software layers. Now in the Linux ecosystem, Linux PTP is the most popular implementation of PTP. It supports several profiles, including GPTP and EVMU automotive profile. Linux PTP provides some utility tools to carry out the time synchronization. The first one is a PTP 4L, which is nothing but a demo that synchronizes PTP hardware clock from the NIC. The next came PHC 2 cs which is also demo that synchronizes the PHC and the system clock. The last is a PMC, which is a utility to configure the PTP 4L in the runtime. Though PTP is a user level step, the kernel provides some component to access the PTP hardware. As shown in the figure, it supports the hardware and software timestamping via the SO timestamping socket. And it deals directly with the hardware using the Linux PTP hardware clock or simply PHC subsystem. One thing to be noted here that all nodes must support the PTP mechanism to, in order to synchronize the clock effectively in the network. Now let's see the how traffic scheduling is handled in the Linux. In the TSN, the traffic scheduling is standardized as the IEEE 802.1 QBV standard. In the Linux, there is a traffic control system or TC utility, which is responsible for handling of network traffic scheduling. It uses transmission algorithm specified by FQTSS and it is supported by TC queuing disciplines or simply QDisk. The term FQTSS is used to describe set of tools which are used to forward and queue the time sensitive streams. A queue disk is a scheduler which controls when to send a packet to the stream and when to pass the packet to upper layer. And this is basically defined by the decided by the different parameter which is configured by the TC utility. Now there are basically three queue disks which are supported in the Linux TSN. The first one is a CBS queries, which detail implements the credit based mechanism and it is introduced by the IEEE 802.1 QAV amendment. It basically schedules the transmission, transmission according to how the bandwidth or the credit which is reserved for a given outbound queue. The another queue is a time over priority shaper or simply a preview. It implements the IEEE 802.1 QBV standard. It works on a basic concept of time division multiple access where the channel is divided into small small time slot and the different time, time slots are assigned and configured based on the priority. The third one is the earliest EX time first or simply ETF queue disk. It basically enables the frame to be transmitted at a specific time frame. In the Linux, this hardware feature is enabled through the SOTX time socket and the ETF queue disk. Here, the SOTX time socket option allows application to configure the transmission time for each frame, while the ETF queries, which ensures that the frames coming from the multiple socket are sent to the hardware ordered by the transmission time. So far, we discussed that all assuming that the network has only N device, but that's not true, right? It might possible that network consists one or multiple switches and switch terminals. So to support this type of scenarios, Linux provides basically two frameworks. One is a DSA or distributed switch algorithm, and second one is a switch devo. 
the dsa is initially introduced by the marvel in 2008 to support their own switches later on other vendors have also added dsa in their own ips and contributed in the linux code and that's how the dsa has been grown a ethernet switch is basically having a multiple front port front panel ports and the multiple cpu or management ports the dsa relies on the management port which is connected directly to the ethernet controller here the distinct distributed parts comes from the possibility that to have multiple switches connected together through the dedicated ports the main idea behind the dsa is to reuse the available internal representation and tools to describe and configure the switches as a common logical component in contrast to dsa the switch dev is a more recent approach which focusing on outsourcing the maximum possible work to the hardware this way it enables the replacement of proprietary sdks and software with a standard open linux interface this approach is effective for both server side on smart nics as well as routers and switches this allows end user to remove the dependency of vendor specific apis we cannot consider switch dev as a traditional linux device model now let's look for the overall summary of tsn so far there are many ieee standards which are available under tsn but not all of them are implemented in the linux currently only few of the protocol like time synchronization traffic scheduling and framing are supported under the linux either fully or partially the main reason is that it was already a part of avb and it is a very old the different vendors have also sent the patches for various tsn implementation but those are either under review or dropped though the majority of the protocol are implemented or supported as a linux alternatives one of the example is abn which is a group of the member companies and it is working together for the tsn in its solutions let's see the quick overview of physical layer of automotive ethernet the initial standard was officially released in the 2011 by border reach group which is formed by the multiple companies and mainly promoted by the broadcom corporation later in 2015 it was standardized by the ieee under ieee 802.1 bp which is known as 100 base d1 as you can see in the image that it uses two wire in a crystal pen form instead of four wires which we are using in the conventional ethernet here in t1 the one denotes that it is a single twisted pair of wire later on a new standard was added for higher bandwidth as ieee 802.1 bw and it supports the 1000 mbps speed and which is known as a gigabit ethernet here you can see the basic characteristics of 100 base t1 and 1000 base t1 both are supporting a full duplex mode and multi level pam3 coding means there can be a 3 bits for the sim mode both support the bandwidth up to 600 megahertz the maximum length of the cable can go up to 15 meter while gigabit ethernet can support up to 40 meters of cable with a optical fiber here the 100 base t1 supports the additional features like energy efficient ethernet so now let's conclude the session we we have seen the automotive vehicle from the last 3 to 4 decades and it has become our part of the life which we cannot imagine the world without it from initial days to now automotive vehicles have become complex and more user friendly but as a side effect the amount of cabling has been increased significantly over the time so if we can reduce and simplify the cabling it benefits at the multiple level like fuel consumption is reduced due to the reduction of the weight the issues while repairing or servicing is reduced the cost of manufacturing of vehicle is also reduced now and less time is required to assemble the vehicle here automotive ethernet fulfills all the criteria and there are active contribution from the different vendors and the organization at hardware and software level to make it more robust 
but there are also some challenges which industry is facing like timing and cost are high for the development of testing of ecu because there are dependencies of vendors and multiple certifications are involved in the development cycle as automotive ethernet directly integrates with the common tcp ip stack the security flow is added by default due to a high electromagnetic interference robust cabling is needed to safeguard the data for redundancy if we increase the error correction bits then bandwidth is reduced and if we increase the bandwidth then error correction bit is reduced so yeah that's it from my side and i am happy to address your question and thank you for your attending the session